In his recent State of the Union address, President Joe Biden talked about in vitro fertilization is a miracle. Uh, Donald Trump also recently endorsed the practice. And so how are Catholics to respond to this as a pro-life faith? Uh, a lot of people may misunderstand what the process involves with in vitro fertilization, or maybe it's impacted your family in one way or another. Today, we're going to take a deep dive in this with a uh, apologist and author, Trent Horn. Now, before we do, uh, I first want to thank a sponsor of the Lust is Boring podcast, which is the Ministry of Restored. Um, if you come from a divorce or broken family, it's a pretty common to struggle with things like emotional problems, relationship struggles, bad habits, things like that. Or you might actually be afraid that you're going to repeat the mistakes you saw in your parents' marriage. Um, well, the good news is that you're not doomed to repeat your family's dysfunction. You can actually write your own story. Uh, but to do that, you need to heal and kind of build virtue. So uh, the solution to this, um, that's why I personally recommend this ministry, Restored. You might not be familiar with them, but what they do is they teach you how you can actually heal and build virtue so you can break the cycle of broken relationships. They've got a bunch of resources, and I'd recommend starting with their podcast. So uh, whether you come from a broken family or you know someone who does, the Restored Podcast is there for you. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. If you want to see a curated list of the episodes they have and listen to the podcast, you just go to restoredministry.com slash chastity, or you can just click the link and the note, show notes below. And so check out Restore. You might not be familiar with them, but it's a tremendous gift for those who just want to break the cycle of broken marriages and their family, starting with themselves. Now, I also want to thank uh, those who are supporting our podcast through Patreon. If you want to join that community and help us to grow, uh, or if maybe this show has been a blessing to you, uh, please prayerfully consider supporting us there. You just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett. Now, as I'd mentioned, our guest today, Trent Horn, longtime staff apologist and author for Catholic Answers, a father of three, and the host of the podcast, The Council of Trent. Here's Trent Horn today on the Lust is Boring podcast. Trent, th thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Now, you're, you're joining us from Dallas out there? I am. That's correct. And pr proud father of three kids, correct? How's that been? Uh, you know, it's three boys, nine, six, and three. So right. they, they can be a little bit of a handful sometimes, but they're great. I love, um, having three boys and, uh, it's, it's just been a, a real treat out here with them. They love Texas and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, we're, we're spoiled, rotten, blessed with eight little kiddos, you know, and I can honestly say the, uh, I mean, the gift of life of being a father is, you know, I think it's the greatest joy you can know on earth. I don't think you can get much better than that. And I think it ties well into the topic today of in vitro fertilization because, um, you know, you go to a, a mass, I was at Easter mass and the priest thanked us afterwards, all the families, the little ones. And he said, you know, please, you know, don't be ashamed of your kids crying in mass. He said, look, if a church is not crying, it's dying. And just appreciating, you know, but, but you know, part of me thought, okay, what if I was the prisoner who's there struggling with infertility, wanting to have a family, uh, but it's pretty quiet in my pew, you know, because our spouse, you know, my spouse and I, we've been trying for 10 years and we've tried this and we've tried that and nothing's working. And people look at us like, wow, why aren't they having kids? They just don't prioritize the family. Maybe they're putting their professional life first. You know, it can be an unbelievable cross for people who want nothing more than to be a father and a mother. And then when they hear like Joe Biden's State of the Union address of just like yeah. in vitro fertilization is a miracle, you know, and then d p former President Donald Trump coming out like, hey, we need to make sure that, you know, we're, we're just supporting families and helping people to have families. I mean, it sounds like right. such an incredibly positive thing. And during that State of the Union, um, you know, President Biden, I think, was playing a little bit loose with the facts in the uh, recent Supreme Court ruling over in Alabama. Um, right. We're going to dive through all this today uh, of just the, the moral yeah. implications of in vitro. But maybe let's start up at the top there of that State of the Union address with Biden. Um, you know, was he mischaracterizing what actually took place in the Alabama Supreme Court ruling? Could you give us a little bit of a legislative background as to what he was talking about there? Well, I think what uh, President Biden and other Democrats and other defenders of legal abortion, because you have those on, on in both the Democrat and the Republican Party, frankly, mm -hmm. as we, we've seen since Roe versus Wade was overturned, uh, they framed the issue of in vitro fertilization as the Supreme Court case as the idea of uh, wild-eyed religious fundamentalists who are out 
to get rid of in vitro fertilization and that the court was just uh, out, you know, as an activist court out to do something like this, to impose a religious will on the country or, or something like that. What happened in that case is actually a lot more interesting and shows that uh, in vitro fertilization clinics cannot have it both ways. And it reveals something very different than what you have with regulation of the abortion industry. So the abortion industry tries very, very hard to depersonalize unborn children. Say these are you know not human beings, not persons. This uses fetal tissue, biomedical waste, basically. But because you're trying to get rid of this human being, the in vitro fertilization industry, however, is about trying to, to value the life that is being created. Now they disvalue life because a lot of human embryos are killed in this process. We'll get to that shortly. But it's different than the abortion industry because people going into IVF ha often have quite the love and affection for these human embryos. They would consider them their children. So what happened in this case was a few years ago at this facility in Alabama, a patient walked into the area where these human embryos were stored and uh, began to open it. And because of the extreme cold of how the embryos are kept in liquid nitrogen, dropped them. And this caused the death of some of these human embryos. Uh, these were people, you know, like you said, people who struggle with fertility issues. These were, they saw them as their children. This is their chance to have children. These are their children. And so the parents sued the IVF center for wrong, not just for destruction of property, they sued for wrongful death. Just as you would sue if you left your child at a daycare facility and somebody walked into the back and picked up your child out of a crib and dropped them and killed them, uh, you would say, hey, this is gross negligence that led to the death of my child. You have to be held responsible for this. So what the court recognizes is that everybody involved in this agreed that these are human beings, the parents who are involved, the IVF center running this, because you don't implant non-human embryos into human beings. Uh, but the court said, look, if you're going to recognize that, yes, you can sue under Alabama statutes for wrongful death of these embryos, especially in regards to how the state laws relate to the unborn now that ab abortion laws have been overturned in Roe v. Wade. So you can't have it both ways. You can't sue for the wrongful death of a human embryo at the negligence of, a, of the IVF clinic, but then also say, oh, well, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that IVF clinic uh, purposely destroying human embryos that are considered less than high enough quality. And honestly, Jason, most of this IVF clinics, they're, they're closing. They don't want to operate there because it's too much of a legal liability for them to be sued for the wrongful death of human embryos. So that's really the, the issue here, though it does open the door to the larger moral question of if these are human embryos, how should they be treated under the law? So you can even table the question of whether this procedure should be outlawed or not. I personally think it's great just to have the ability to sue IVF clinics for wrongful death because it makes perfect sense in that context. And they don't even want to operate because they don't want to take on that risk. Yeah. So, so essentially their main objection is it's hurting their bottom line. I mean, that, that's the ultimate right. thing of what they're concerned about. Now for people who, they, well, they, they want to, they want to charge Jason for the benefit of creating human life and the benefits from parents being, Oh, I can finally become pregnant, but they're not willing to undertake the financial risks of being held responsible for the wrongful deaths mm -hmm. of these unique individual human beings that they are creating. Now, for a lot of people, uh, you know, who are looking at this, who are not involved in it, they might confuse artificial insemination, in right. fertilization. Yes. you know, what's this, what's that? You know, why isn't the church in favor of helping people have families? I mean, isn't the church pro-life? And now the church is wanting to kind of butt its nose into the bedroom and tell people, oh, we're pro-life, but you can't have your family because you're not having it right. our way. Can you maybe help walk the viewers and listeners through how does this process actually work? How is it distinct from artificial insemination or other fertility treatments out there? Right. So the Catholic Church is not opposed to fertility treatments. The Catholic Church is not opposed to medicine that cures infertility. It's absolutely not opposed to that. Paragraph 2375 of the Catechism says, couples who discover that they are sterile suffer greatly. Research aimed at reducing human sterility is to be encouraged on condition that it is placed at the service of the human person, of his inalienable rights, and his true and integral good according to the design and the will and will of God. So we see here 
that what is uh, permitted is to treat and cure infertility. Uh, in 2008, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, released a document called Dignitanus Personae. And it laid down a helpful principle in section 12 that fertility treatments that substitute for the marital act, the conjugal act between a husband and wife, if a, if a treatment substitutes for the conjugal act, it is wrong. It's not permitted. But if it acts as an aid to the conjugal act and its fertility, then it is permitted. So that gives you a wide range of different ways of treating infertility. So for example, surgery that removes scar tissue in the fallopian tubes, or medications to help improve a man's sperm count, for example. Those would be things that assist the conjugal act. It removes barriers that make pregnancy less likely when a husband and wife come together. Those are perfectly legitimate. The, the church approves these are moral goods. These are goods of the human person that we promote. But as you go through, on the other end would be acts that don't, they do not assist the marital act, they replace it. So clear examples would be, for example, you mentioned artificial insemination, where uh, a man, for example, will generate sperm often through the sinful act of masturbation, and then that is then inserted uh, into the woman's body uh, in order to allow conception to take place. Uh, so that would that would not be permitted. Uh, then finally, but however, so that's artificial insemination. That is just the fertilization of the embryo. The creation of the human being still takes place within the mother's body in a case like artificial insemination. That's what we would call in vivo fertilization in the body. In vitro fertilization kind of takes artificial insemination, but then it goes further. The man, uh, the sperm is taken from the man's body. A egg is taken from the woman's body. Then they are placed in a Petri dish in a laboratory and the fertile act of fertilization takes place there and multiple human embryos are then created. One of the embryos is then selected to be implanted into the mother's body uh, to continue to develop while the others are either placed into cryogenic preservation indefinitely or they are purposefully destroyed. Uh, and the church would say the destruction of human life is bad in and of itself. But even if you didn't destroy excess embryos, that act would still be wrong because children have the right to be the fruit of the marital act. Uh, so uh, uh, cat paragraph 2378 of the catechism puts this well. A child may not be considered a piece of property, an idea to which an alleged right to a child would lead, only the child possesses genuine rights, the right, quote, to be the fruit of the specific act of the conjugal love of his parents. That was an excellent points. I remember speaking at a, a junior high in the Midwest several years ago, and we did like a, a Q&A after the presentation. And one of the girls, like, you know, tell by the handwriting, um, I just dumped into this, you know, Q&A basket, uh, you know, and we hadn't even talked about you know, fertility treatments or anything like that. It was just a basic junior high chastity talk. And she dumped into the Q&A basket. Well, you know, my question is with in vitro fertilization, you know, that's how I was conceived. Does God not want me to exist? And, you know, I remember just, just pausing there, just the, the weight of that. You could tell that this girl had carry that in her heart for a very long time. Like, I know what the church teaches on this. So what the church basically teaches is that I should not be. And so what I tried to do in that discussion with her is explain, okay, think of all the different ways that human life could be created. You could have a, a husband and a wife on their wedding night, you know, um, you could have an act of sexual abuse that brings life into existence or rape. You could have something in vitro or fiddle insemination, whether it's cloning, I don't know, like there's, there's so many different means by which human life can come into existence. And if you were to pick something that's objectively wrong, such as, you know, sexual assault, and then a child comes forth from that, the goodness of the child does not determine the morality of the act of conception. And the immorality of the act of conception tells us nothing about the goodness of the child. And so I said, you know, what I want you to remember is next time you go to mass and you hear those words that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life, that technically that doctor didn't give you a soul. He didn't give you life. The Holy Spirit right. gave you life. God wants you to be. And she came up afterwards. The question was anonymous, but then she came up afterwards mm. and she 
steps. She was like, today is the first day that I actually believe God wants me to exist. Yeah. Um, and so what would you say, you know, in your own words to, to, to parents or to kids who are like, okay, so you're basically saying my eight-year-old daughter and my four-year-old son here that we have in our family pictures that God didn't want them to exist. Like, how are we supposed to even be a Catholic family agreeing that our kids shouldn't exist. And so speak a little bit about how to delicately untangle this deeply emotional, you know, issue of, okay, is the church saying my family shouldn't be after the fact? What would you say to that? Yeah, I think what we should point here, and you you brought up a good point, that a lot of people think that we live in a, a technocratic society as if scientists are God and of themselves. Like, look, they created this life. No, they did not. If God willed it, uh, those IVF technicians would be completely incapable of creating human beings. You can make it so every single time they try to use this technology, it would fail. He could make it the case that none of us uh, ever conceive children because he is the Lord of life. Uh, and everyone who exists, exists because God loves that person. And you're right, even if they come into existence through evil means, their good, the means do not take away from their goodness. So mm. I think one way I might go about it in talking to people is to say, all right, let's talk about a child who comes into existence, a little baby in the womb. What does that child have a right to? Let's talk, because a lot of times we look at the question from the other perspective, what do we as adults have right? I have a right to have a family. I have a, and we do, you have a right to marry, you have a right to associate, but you don't have a right to a child because as the catechism points out, nobody has the right to another human being. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's not correct, but let's look at from the child's perspective. So let's take another example. Would you say that a child in the womb, especially those who are faithful Catholics who struggle with IVF, does that child have the right, not just to live in his mother's womb, but the right to be cared for by his mother and father? Does that child in the womb have the right so that when he is born, there are two people committed to caring for him because those two people have already committed to one another in a lifelong bond. Does that child have the right that when he comes into existence, there are two people, they are lifelong committed to him because they are lifelong committed to each other, aka does that child have the right to come into existence as the fruit of marital love? And I would say yes, that when children come into existence outside of marital love, so the example we give here would be fornication, which is fairly common. But we see that children, it's good they exist, but there's often harm that is involved there. Uh, you know, that you have lack of family stability. Uh, you have more likely to lead to family breakdown, that a child should not have to come into existence and then grow up worrying like, oh, what's, you know, are these, you know, is this, am I part of a family? Is this just cohabiting? What's going on here? That even though that child is good, the way they've come to existence, that child lost something they had the right to. In that case, it would be the right to come into existence within the, the solid bond of marriage and how good and beautiful it is for the family. And he had a right to come into existence in that way and was deprived and harmed by not coming in that way. And so that, that, that should be understood, even though the child is good, it's good the child exists, but not necessarily good that the child came into existence that way. Likewise, in IVF, a child has the right to come into existence within the safety within the body of his mother, to not come into existence as a commodity who is created in a laboratory, to not come into existence to be judged by laboratory technicians to determine, is this child good enough to pass the test to go to phase two and be implanted in the womb? Uh, a child is good enough and has intrinsic dignity not to be subjected to something so dehumanizing. And then I think it's also helpful, Jason, when people bring this up to say that, if you to say, look, if you say that this is a moral thing to create children this way, even though you and your family can have a, an ordered, healthy family in spite of what's happened in the past, what about the other consequences? What about the unmarried parent, the unmarried man who orders an egg donor, a sperm donor, a gestational surrogate to carry the pregnancy and the child is born and then the child is delivered to him. We have all of the technology and there's people who do acquire children in this way. Are you going to tell me that a child is perfectly normal for a child to come into existence in that way? Not what your gut is telling you, that child's rights were violated. And if we say their rights are violated, we have to go all the way back to the beginning and say, how should children come into existence and what should we defend on this matter for their 
well-being and their good. Yeah. And, and the violation of the rights of the kids that aren't actually born through the process. I mean, how many, right. I don't know if you've got the numbers, but uh, what, how many embryos are typically created in order for one to actually become viable and born? Do you know what the, the numbers are in yeah. terms of, you know, they, they'll, they create a dozen or, or more? Because I, I've, you know, my understanding is that typically that you have to, you know, rounds of IVF, you know, where there's going to be a lot of failed implantations. Correct. Implanting multiple. But what about the rights of those kids? Do you have any numbers on that? So we're not, we're not just looking at the end product of one child, but what was the cost to bring that one into existence? Right. Yeah. I, I don't know the numbers right off the top yeah. of my head, but if you think about the number of IVF cases, the thousands of tens of thousands of pregnancies that result from in vitro fertilization every year, uh, that's why the companies like in Alabama are shutting down because their business model, if they're held liable for the human embryos that are not implanted in the womb, it's not uh, cost effective for them to simply create one embryo and then implant that embryo. There are ways of, of doing that, but typically they're trying to screen these embryos for things like genetic defects, for example, or screen them for other things such as for uh, biological sex. Do you want a boy or do you want a girl, for example? Uh, so they're, they'll be screening for these things and having more embryos is just helpful for them to do that. And that's why many people choose they don't know if they're going to have other children or not. They don't know if they want to go through another implantation process. So they'll place these children in the crowd preservation, which has led to the tragedy of thousands of children being left in cryostasis where they uh, are alive, but they cannot continue to develop. And we don't really know the long-term effects of keeping them in stasis like this for so long, mm -hmm. uh, that it leads to a situation that the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith has said is, is a situation of an injustice that doesn't appear to be able to be resolved. Any way we look into it is going to be can be unnatural. I'm working on an anthology now where even Catholic theologians disagree about how we should uh how we should treat human embryos who are in cryopreservation. Should we uh implant them? But does that violate God's design that only a father should cause a pregnancy and only a husband should cause a pregnancy in his wife? Or do we just abandon them in cryopreservation? What everybody what all the theologians agree on is we should not create children to end up in this position in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And my understanding too, is if the parents want to keep the child in that state of preservation, you know, because, Hey, you know, maybe we'll want to have another pregnancy five years from now and then yeah. we'll just keep it. You know, it's about a, my understanding is like a thousand dollars a year that they have to pay these clinics. And you start doing the math. I, I heard recently that there's about a million frozen embryos in the United States alone. And then you just start doing the math on this thing. And then now it's not technically a thousand customers because one customer might have a dozen embryos in there. Um, but, you know, so sometimes you'll hear that objection and just to play devil's advocate. Well, you're saying, OK, well, it's not moral to create one human life when all these other lives are lost in the process. Well, if that's the case, Trent, then when how come, you know, so many miscarriages happen, you know, and so many of them are happening within the first few weeks of gestation that you're probably having, what, one full-term pregnancy for every couple of miscarriages that happens so early on. And so if God has ordained a woman's fertility to just that miscarriage is just part of the process, then then why is it immoral that something similar happened through the in vitro process? How would you answer uh, that objection? What I would say is that's like saying what's immoral about going into the uh, hot to a senior citizen's home, uh, a retirement community and killing 80 year olds and 90 year olds uh, because you like will feel like, well, we can't really take care of these individuals. Uh, what someone could make a parallel argument, say what's wrong with that? when 30% of these people would die in a year anyways. Uh, to say that we should have the right to use in vitro fertilization to create human beings, even if it involves killing human beings, directly killing human beings in the process, because humans naturally die through the process of pregnancy anyways through miscarriage, well, that would justify a whole host of evils that most people are opposed to. Uh, human beings have a 100% mortality rate. We all will die at some point. It doesn't follow we have the right to directly take human life. So there is quite a difference between choosing to directly kill individuals 
who are created in a process and going through a process where human beings just have a high mortality rate. That there are some people, Jason, will say, well, how can you say these are persons when 50%, let's say, let's say 50% of embryos uh, fail to implant or are miscarried. Uh, let's say human um, unborn children, let's say they have a 50% mortality rate. That doesn't follow that they're not human beings. Throughout most of human history and in some rural parts of the world today, child mortality is 50%. What that means is throughout human history is very common. Half of all children did not live to see their fifth birthday, that they died. Typically, they died in infancy from dysentery, diseases that caused dehydration, illness. If they made it past that to two or three, they often died in accidents uh, and other illnesses. Uh, but just because half of all children died by the age of five, it wouldn't follow. You could just kill toddlers because you felt that that was most expedient. So that's why I find these arguments to be uh, unpersuasive, to say the least. Now, to continue to play the role of devil's advocate, let's say, uh, Trent Horn, you're on a college campus. You're doing one of your talks on sexual ethics or pro-life stuff. Maybe you're doing a debate. University students gets up in the audience. And it's like, OK, Trent, you know, why are you just so opposed to reproductive freedom? Um, how would you answer an objection like that? Well, I'd say I would. I am not opposed to reproductive freedom. In fact, I believe that it's a good thing when people reproduce, and that human beings have the right to. They have a natural right to marry, to so to join in these lifelong bonds bonds that are ordered towards reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have no problem with reproductive freedom. It seems like what you are arguing for, if you're arguing, for example, for contraception or abortion, that's the freedom to, and it's not even what you're arguing for, is not the freedom to not reproduce. Uh, I also believe in that freedom as well. Like if you want to become a, a celibate monk or a priest or an unmarried person who chooses to serve the community, I'm all for that freedom as well. You're not arguing for the freedom to reproduce or the freedom to not reproduce. You're arguing for the freedom to reproduce to engage to either in contraception, to engage in the act ordered towards reproduction, but to stop reproduction from that act, or in the case of abortion, to actually reproduce, to create, procreate a new human life, and then end that human life. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, in vitro fertilization, I think what I would say, actually, I guess I might go back. Um, I'm not against what you call reproductive freedom, but that's not a term that I would necessarily use. I don't even like the term reproduction. Human beings don't reproduce in the same way a copy machine reproduces a document. Uh, we procreate. We don't reproduce. Uh, we, we partner with God to create a new human life. So you might be arguing for in IVF, mechanical, technocratic, commercial reproduction of human life that ultimately becomes commercialized, as I explained earlier. I'm saying that human beings have the freedom to procreate and children have the right to be the fruit of procreation, not the product of commercial reproduction. No, it's good stuff. And then, you know, two last questions. One more, continue to play devil's advocate. You know, sure. another stands up and okay, okay, Trent, well, you know, who, why are you just so obsessed just with controlling women's bodies? You know, why can't a woman have a right over her own body, her own sexuality, her own dreams of a family without you kind of patriarchal, white, heterosexual, religious male and your legislators and your church getting into the bedroom, kind of telling her what to do with her body? So that's the objection. How are you going to answer that one? Oh, are you saying are you I would ask them first, are you saying that only women can get pregnant? That's always a fun one just to start oh, off. The uh, you're asking for trouble there. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it so much more fun just to just to start right there. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is your argument seems to be assuming that only women can get pregnant. Is that something you're willing to hold to? And then sometimes <laughs> it become apoplectic when I when I bring that up. Uh, so I would say here is that uh, no, I am not inordinately focusing on controlling women's bodies. I am focusing on protecting the lives of human beings, male and female. I could ask this individual, do you think that rape should be illegal? Uh, first degree rape, for example. Uh, obviously, it, it should. And especially marital rape. Marital rape was not illegal in this country until just a few decades ago. And I strongly believe marital rape should be illegal. Now, do laws against rape, are they only about controlling male bodies since the vast, vast majority of individuals who are convicted of first-degree rape 
are male. In some jurisdictions, only men are capable of crimes like first degree rape, for example, defined by things like penetration. But we wouldn't say, oh, those laws are just policing men's bodies. No, the laws are meant to protect human beings. And because of the nature of our biology, which is equal in dignity, but unequal in function between human beings, the laws happen to affect men more because only men are capable of engaging in particular acts defined legally as, as rape, for example. Likewise, saying that I believe that both men and women should be legally prohibited from harming unborn children. Men harm unborn children indirectly by uh, performing abortions or paying others to do that. And women, it's men's bodies, or I should say men's bodies are involved indirectly in harming unborn children. Women's bodies are more directly involved because, once again, of our differing biology. But it doesn't follow that laws that affect men and women differently, it doesn't mean it treats them differently in the area of their dignity. It just recognizes legitimate sexual differences and protects innocent people based on those legitimate differences. Good points. Now, just wrapping up, putting apologetics aside and the debate and all that, let's sure. say you've got a, a Catholic couple, maybe perhaps listening to this, understands the merits of the argument. They, they are pro-life. They want a family. They've been seriously considering IVF. And they're wondering, okay, well... <laughs> Uh, what's our alternative? I mean, we've tried this, we've tried that. Um, you know, what other alternative is there for us out there? You know, what would you say to that family? And, and what if every alternative we try fails? Th then where does that leave us? What I would say is, once again, to not look at children as, or not look at any other human being as something one has a right to, but to understand that human beings that are bonded to us are a gift that God has given us. So for example, there are some people who are never given the gift of marriage. They seek out marriage. It's something they discern as a vocation, but they are unable to find someone who consents to marry them. And that was so it seems that marriage was not uh, what God willed for them as a person, but it doesn't mean that God did not have a wonderful plan for them, even though they wanted the good of marriage. And something similar happens. Some people do receive the good of marriage, the gift of marriage, but not the gift of children, that God may have something else for them to be able to call and to, to serve others. And to understand that anytime the things that God gives us as gifts are health, uh, marriage, friendship, children, that a lot of times in life, the crosses that we carry are when God has not given us these particular gifts is what God said to St. Paul. He, you know, and Paul asked him three times, remove the thorn in my side. Uh, he did not. And God, Paul said that God told him, uh, my, your grace is made, my power is made perfect in weakness, uh, that the grace abounds in us carrying these crosses that God gives us in regardless of what are gifts they, there may be that God has not given us. And also that maybe God is calling us to some other good, uh, that this, this trial leads us to another good that he's calling us towards. So yeah. for example, some people who are married, but not blessed with children, God may be calling them to better serve their community more that when you don't have children, you might have more time and resources to serve their parish community, to serve society, to do missionary work, to find with to find in that God maybe have take it may have not gifted a child, but something else may be present for a good for the couple to pursue. And in some cases, that's why I'm very curious. Notice I said that first. I'm not saying, oh, well, God wants them to adopt. Not necessarily. So I, I do think that people who are struggling with infertility should not think that they have a, a, a moral obligation to adopt children, for example. They may not. That's something else to discern if God wants them to do that, though it may be something that God is calling them to. I know a couple, actually, you, they can go to National Review. Uh, there is an article, they're friends of mine, and I could talk about it. It's by Catherine Jean Lopez, John and Kristen Meyer. There's a wonderful article here called Yesterday Was One Beautiful Boy's Independence Day to the relief of his foster parents. And it's about my friends, John and Kristen Meyer, who uh, were married. They're a wonderful young Catholic couple. We've always enjoyed our, our, our time with them. They're, they're hospitable and generous. They, they could not have children. And so they, were, they blessed as many people as they could with their hospitality. Uh, they lived in Southern California, always hosted people, 
very generous, hospitable individuals. And then through, and there's a long story related to it, you can read an article, but they were, they, through just random circumstance, they came into contact with a boy who was in foster care, whose parents were quite derelict. And the child was being raised by relatives who really couldn't raise him much longer. And they stepped in and they fought hard for years, or maybe not, well, at least more than a year, one to two years, months and months and months to finally adopt him, little Noah. And they have provided a, a beautiful life for him. And the story, you can read about it here. Uh, it's from uh, two years ago, published in the National Review. Yesterday was One Beautiful Boy's Independence Day by Catherine Jean Lopez. And that's one example. I'm not saying everyone struggling with infertility is called necessarily to something like that. But whenever God gives us a cross to carry, we should pray and be open to the beautiful goods God may be leading us to walk towards while we are carrying those crosses. Yeah, I've got uh, friends from college that when they got married, all they wanted to have is a big family and they got yeah. married to their surprise just wasn't possible. Um, you know, years of infertility, miscarriages, and they thought, OK, what's God calling us to? And they prayed and discerned, well, maybe foster parenting. And so they started, you know, bringing in some foster kids one after the other. And with foster parenting, you don't really necessarily know if you're going to have that kid for a week to care for them or a lifetime. Right depending on where things pan out over the span of uh, perhaps a decade, they ended up taking 50 foster kids, you know, not, not obviously all at once, but over the span, they had cared for that many kids. And then there was a little lull in the schedule where there weren't any at their house. And they're like, well, let's just take a little break right now. Just take a little breather and get, guess what happened? They got pregnant and then they got pregnant again, 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 again. <laughs> they're like five or six successful pregnancies after a de more than a decade of infertility. And so God had this marvelous plan for their family. Uh, and instead of just saying, okay, if I don't get what I want, then I begin to grasp, you know, that being kind of the operative word, like, am I, am I receiving from the father? Am I kind of grasping for what it is that I think that I need? And, you know, one thing I think we, we would be remiss not saying is that there are alternatives out there medically that a lot of people are unaware of. Uh, one that comes to mind is a uh, NAPRO technology, which is natural procreative technology. You go to naprotechnology.com. We'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, the work there of Dr. Thomas Hilgers has just been remarkable. I mean, you talk about anyone who thinks, I think deserves a Nobel Prize for his work in women's health. Um, it's that guy, uh, the Pope Paul VI Institute for Human Reproduction that he had started up. But yeah, NAPRO technology, because a lot of times, uh, you know, once the advent of the pill came around, there's just a lot of lazy gynecology and there wasn't a lot of advancement being made. If like, well, if we don't need to really fix the underlying cause of the infertility right. and we can just use artificial insemination or in vitro, then why invest all this research time and money into actually going to the core need uh, and actually healing that? Um, so I'd, I'd strongly recommend for any couples wrestling with infertility to check out naprotechnology.com. And I don't know if you know of any other references or things that may be helpful in that regard for alternatives. No, I, I would definitely recommend that. A, a lot of people also just using natural family planning. A lot of people think of natural family planning as only a means to uh, to avoid mm -hmm. uh, pregnancy. But many people use natural family planning as a means to optimize the marital act to give a couple the highest chance of becoming pregnant. That's something that people yeah. also don't talk about for them to look into. Uh, how can people get in touch with you, your resources, your books, uh, just so they can connect with uh, what you're doing and all the apologetics information that you're sharing? So I have my website, trenorn.com. If they go to catholic.com, they can search my name. A lot of my resources are there. Of course, my podcast is The Council of Trent. It's on iTunes, Google Play, and they can find it over on YouTube as well, The Council of Trent. And then books uh, related to this that you've covered. Uh, well, I have covered this, uh, the particular issue of IVF in a book co-authored with my friend Layla Miller called Made This Way. And that book mm -hmm. is actually about how to explain tough moral issues to kids, little and big, uh, though I find many adults were really educated by the book and enjoyed it. So uh, uh, Made This Way uh, by myself, my co-author Layla Miller has several chapters just on uh, reproductive technologies. Fantastic. We'll put a link in the show notes to those things. Uh, again, I want to also thank everybody who's been supporting us on Patreon. Uh, if you want to be part of that communion, uh, community, just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett. helps us to crank out more of these programs and spread the good word. So Trent, thank you for coming on the uh, program and God bless you and your family. Thank you much. <laughs>